Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the first of Saturday's Unity Weekend panels. My name is Ivano Siram. I am a 2001 graduate of Harvard College, a 2007 graduate of Harvard Law School, and I serve as the president of the Harvard Black Alumni Society. I am so thrilled to introduce today's first panel, Environmental Justice, the Enduring Impact and Urgent Challenges for Our Communities. At the outset of today's programming, and given that I'm speaking to you from Southern New Jersey, I acknowledge with gratitude that I stand on the unceded territory known as Lena King, the traditional homelands of the Leni Lenape people who are still here honoring their traditions and illuminating the future with their perseverance. Because we are gathering as Harvard alumni, we honor the traditional custodians of the land on which Harvard University sits, the Massachusetts tribe and their elders, past, present, and emerging. And we honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the first peoples of Massachusetts. We acknowledge and pay our profound respect to the Wampanoag and Nimpuk peoples with whom Harvard has ties and declared obligations through its charter dating back to the university's first two decades. The Harvard Charter of 1650 committed our institution to the education of English and Indian youth of this country. From its origins, our alumni community has been anchored and enriched by First Nations peoples from across the Americas and around the world. The land on which Harvard is situated has been a place of learning for millennia. Our acknowledgement serves as a necessary step away from the erasure of these indigenous histories of perseverance, water and land stewardship, innovation and allyship. Before we begin today's first panel, some brief housekeeping notes. We are using Zoom webinar for today's panel, so while the chat is open for you to engage with each other, please use the Q&A feature, the box at the bottom of your screen to submit questions to the panel. Our moderator for today's discussion on environmental justice is James Jamie Hoyt from the Harvard College class of 1965, with degrees from the law school in 1968 and the Kennedy School in 1986. Jamie retired from Harvard University in 2009, where he was an associate vice president and co-program director of the Working Group on Environmental Justice. During his tenure at Harvard from 1994 until 2009, he was also lecturer on environmental sciences and public policy at Harvard College, adjunct lecturer in public policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and member of the Harvard University Committee on Environment. I'm sure that some of you took his class on environmental justice at Harvard, so we are thrilled to have him back today. From 1983 through 1988, Mr. Hoyt also served as Massachusetts Secretary of Environmental Affairs with responsibility for oversight of the planning and management of all environmental and national resource conservation policies and programs for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You can read more about Jamie and his bio, which is being shared in the chat. Now, it is my pleasure to hand things off to Jamie. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Yvonne, uh, I would like to add my thanks and excitement and express my excitement to the attendees today. It's really wonderful uh, to have all of you as a part of this, what I think is very important, almost historic panel. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this exciting gathering. Indeed, from my perspective, it's particularly significant at this point in time that uh, this group of Harvard alumni should be engaging the issue of environmental justice. It's an important issue uh, that continues to dramatically affect so many of our communities. Moreover, I feel quite privileged to moderate this panel a panel that includes a local elected government official and policymaker, namely Councilwoman Anna Sandoval, a local planning manager and specialist with expertise in climate resilience planning, Sun J. Seth, a member of the Penobscot Nation and university scholar and teacher who specializes in Native American issues, Dr. Darren Ranko and a public health specialist who is a native of Flint, Michigan, and has an intimate knowledge of urban water quality issues, Ms. Jasmine Hall. 
thank you all for being with us on the panel. And you'll be hearing from each one of them in a, in a moment. But let me remind also everybody in attendance that there are links to the bios of each of the panelists and they will appear as they begin to speak. Now, before I ask each of our panelists to tell us a little bit about themselves and what drew each to environmental justice, I'd like to begin the discussion by providing some historical context to the issue of EJ and letting you know how I came to focus on environmental justice and develop Harvard's first and perhaps only academic course that solely focused on the topic. Over the years, there have been many suggested definitions of environmental justice, including an official EPA definition. But I think that um, I would focus on uh, an important part of the EPA definition and one that remains. And that is the requirement really that there be involvement in decision-making that affects the communities that are in uh, environmental justice uh, areas. Thus, I would say that environmental justice, in my mind, means that residents of a community must have the ability to make decisions and be a part of the decision-making processes that involve and affect their immediate environment. Now, I'd like to take a quick moment to uh, provide some historical context with, with respect to environmental justice and environmental justice movements. First, we must recognize that in many ways, the fight against environmental injustices can be traced back to the early public health measures and protections of the early 20th century. Likewise, there were early efforts to protect workers from environmental hazards in the workplace, such as certain mining practices, toxic chemicals in the workplace, um, and, in, and in the manufacturing processes. However, EJ was not understood as a concept and ultimately a movement until the 1980s, even though local community activists were launching protests against environmentally harmful activity in the communities for years. So let's just um, think about some of the uh, key uh, steps or stages of, the, of uh, EJ. Uh, and I think that historically, we think of a national concept of EJ as beginning with the demonstrations against the siting of uh, a PCB landfill in the predominantly uh, black Warren County of North Carolina. And there are a variety of, which I won't take the time to go through, uh, uh, milestones along the way. But I do want to point out very importantly that in 1991, local and regional environmental justice leaders came together in what was called the National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. And that produced principles of environmental justice that still endure. So there, um, uh, continues to be a battle that um, is going on in local communities. But I, one other thing that I think it should, I should mention at the outset is that we have, uh, uh, should have a shared understanding of what we mean by the term environmental justice. Uh, over the years, there have been many suggested definitions of the term, including those that are offered by the um, United States Environmental Protection Agency or EPA. At the center of all definitions of the term are the concepts of race, color, national origin, income, and socioeconomic status, together with an understanding that to have environmental justice, the residents of a community, as I've stated, must have the ability 
to make, to make decisions and be a part of the decision-making processes that <clears throat> involve and affect their immediate environment, their health and their general well-being. An environmental justice community is defined as a community with significant, uh, with a significant population of color and or low income population adversely and disproportionately affected by environmental pollution. One other thing to just state right at the outset is that early leaders of what became known, uh, came to be known as the AJ environmental justice movement emphasized race and racism as a fundamental issue within EJ communities. So I mentioned that right now at the outset because race and racism continues to be a, an important and defining issue with respect to the issues of environmental justice in local communities across the country. And as we think about the history to remind you that there still is resistance to, on the part of uh, dominant um, officials in many of these communities, to want to engage on the issue of race and racism. There's uh, early on when environmental justice came into the forefront, it was called environmental racism. And one reason why it morphed into the term environmental justice was because of this discomfort about talking about race. So it's a uh, troubling and sadly a fact that environmental injustice persists today and persists in local communities throughout the United States, not to mention globally. And resistance to confronting race and racism far too often remains. Now we can come back to some of these uh, discussions uh, later. I wanna launch in and, and engage our wonderful uh, panel and uh, if Councilwoman uh, Sandoval is with us, we can start with her. And one of the things I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to do is to talk about, excuse me, uh, how they uh, came to engage on the issue of environmental justice. How did they get into the topic? And um, then um, we'll have a, opportunity to launch into many other issues and questions. But um, let's start with Anna Sandoval and uh, she can uh, let us know uh, what's happening at the local level uh, in Texas. Ah, well, I, I think uh, Anna has not yet joined us. So I'm gonna jump to Sanjay and ask him actually the same question. How did he begin to engage on the issue of environmental justice and what's happening? I think he's nearby to me in Boston, but let's say, uh, throw thank it over you. to you, Sanjay. <laughs> thank you, Jamie, and thanks to the HAA and all of the uh, SIGs and clubs that have put this together. This is um, a great opportunity to speak to environmental justice with our Harvard alums. Um, so. My name is Sanjay Sait. I currently work for the city of Boston and I manage the Climate Ready Boston program, which is our city's ongoing initiative to prepare and adapt Boston for the effects of climate change. And a really key part of that work is about delivering on environmental justice during the climate crisis. And, you know, while this is definitely not a new topic in Boston, we know that climate change amplifies many of the challenges that have inspired decades of activism around environmental justice. And we know that the disproportionate impact that climate change has on people of color and lower income residents is something we, we have to address. We can't make the same mistakes. And so, you know, as an example, over the past year, our team has been working in Boston uh, to center the experience of environmental justice communities as we develop our citywide plan to prepare for the extreme heat that we can experience from climate change and extreme weather. And we've shown to Jamie's point about environmental racism that we've shown that communities that were redlined in the past still bear the living legacies of that systemic racism and how they experience a heat wave. These neighborhoods have fewer trees, fewer parks, and as a result, hotter days during a heat wave than other parts of the city, up to 10 degrees hotter. And that really matters when you think about the health 
outcomes in these neighborhoods. And so just to share a little bit, and we can get more into this over the panel, but you know, I'm glad to be doing this work in Climate Ready Boston because we have an opportunity as we implement these policies and infrastructure strategies to protect residents from all of the effects of climate change, heat, extreme precipitation, sea level rise, coastal storms. We can bring our history into the foreground and our present into the foreground and make sure that we have an opportunity to not make the same mistakes as we prepare our neighborhoods and residents for the effects of climate change. So thank you again for uh, inviting me to join the panel and I'll pass it back to Jamie. Thank you, uh, Sanjay. And you know, I'm gonna ask the same question of Darren. If he could give us some perspective from his point of view as to how he's engaged on this issue. Thank you. Kachiwal Iwani, Gwegwe, Dendagagio, Nadal Woyazi, Darren Ranko, Gunnawebs Kekawi, Wabanaki Naheme Banage. Thank you all uh, for including me in this panel today. I'm, um, good afternoon, I'm Darren Ranko. I'm a Penobscot Nation citizen. I'm in my homeland uh, of the Wabanaki Confederacy in what is now uh, a place we call Maine, uh, as well as the Maritime Provinces of Canada on a place I call Turkey Hill, where we have turkeys running uh, across my front lawn on a regular basis. Um, <laughs> as a native person, uh, I was lucky enough to grow up in a, in a town next to my reservation and was exposed to our basket making traditions and songs while I was growing up. Um, each of which teach us about um, our responsibilities to our non-human relations. Um, and as an undergrad at Dartmouth College, I started to pursue anthropology uh, as a, an area of study, partly because it was, it was allowing me to ask uh, the difficult questions I was asking of myself and others about culture and identity in ways that I thought was productive. Um, and then as a PhD student in anthropology at Harvard, I began to engage in a project that, that became my dissertation, uh, looking at and fighting against um, the pollution of an upstream paper company um, discharging dioxins into our reservation waters and in impacting my tribe's health, especially those living in the most traditional lifestyles. While my dissertation was completed in 2000, makes me sort of uh, an elder of the panelists, met Jamie about 25 years ago, uh, <laughs> it eventually led to a project uh, funded by the Environmental Protection Agency and completed in 2009 that documented the pollution impacts on traditional lifestyles in, in, uh, of indigenous people in Maine which has in turn in the last decade influenced both federal and state regulatory standards protecting our uh, subsistence uh, fishing uh, rights and lifestyles. Recently, my work has engaged in uh, climate justice, uh, uh, rematriation and land back work with our tribal nations. Um, and it is in that um, the connection between those, the, the, the legacy pollution of course still out there, but uh, climate justice, our, our attempts and our work to regain um, uh, access and uh, rematriate lands, which is really about healing our relationships to um, place and, and uh, our non-human relations and our responsibilities to them. And, and I know that the uh, cultural and political frameworks that uh, are climate justice oriented, indigenous people are critical to and, um, I've been really excited to be a part of those larger discussions, both in our state, but uh, regionally and across the, the border where I think um, some of the most creative kind of engagements are happening related to climate justice work that, that take ecosystems and indigenous territories as, as their basis and really expound upon that for both cultural and political action and protection. So I'm looking forward to talking more about that. And uh, just again, thank you once again for uh, uh, including me in this panel. Thank you, Darren, that, that's wonderful. And um, we'll be looking forward to some more discussion uh, on some of these issues. Now I'd like to move to uh, Jasmine Hall, who is uh, really knowledgeable about public health issues uh, amongst others. And um, Jasmine, again, I'm gonna ask to, that you start with the, the same topic of how did you become engaged in uh, the environmental justice uh, issue, if you will. Yes, so thank you for having me. Um, as you said, I'm Jasmine Hall. 
I'm a 27 year old black woman from the north side of Flint. Um, I came into this environmental justice work uh, by caring about people actually. I was studying neuroscience and psychology at Central Michigan University when the Flint water crisis um, started. And of course, you know, we know this is one of the most disastrous man-made environmental justice issues of our time. Um, it actually made me interested in how do I combine this interest that I have in neuro and psych with public health? Um, so I, I went to the Chan School and graduated in 2019 um, with a Master of Science in Neuropsychiatric Epi um, and concentrations in population mental health and then public health leadership. And immediately after I moved home um, to Flint to give back. Some of the environmental justice efforts that I've been involved in um, since moving home is uh, work at the Flint Registry. So it's a CDC fund funded project, um, an intervention really to kind of follow up with people exposed to the Flint water crisis, connect our community to the resources and services that can help mitigate the impact of the water crisis on our health, and then provide the data that's gonna drive those policy decisions um, down the road. I'm also um, involved with Black Millennials for Flint, which is an environmental justice uh, organization of mm. kind of like-minded like -minded millennials in Flint, DC, Baltimore, and Memphis um, to ensure that EJ issues like the Flint water crisis don't happen in other Black and Brown communities. Um, and we also engage around the climate crisis because we have to. Um, mm. I'm, I'm also a mentor for the Flint Public Health Youth Academy. Um, so Dr. Kent Key, he uh, had this idea to help build up the next generation of public health leaders um, in the city of Flint, opening, opening doors to opportunities to um, link public health into any career that, that these youth decide to do. Um, and then I'm also the health and environment to justice chair for the Flint branch of the NAACP, which is a historical civil rights organization. Um, so I've, I've been really engaged since moving home um, around EJ, even though it wasn't the exact thing I studied, um, it, it totally intersects with, with everything that I do. So thank you so much for having me here. Well, you're clearly a busy woman. So <laughs> thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, let's, uh, we, we have some other questions that we want to explore and I, um, I'm going to uh, move to another and ask each one of the panelists if they'd comment on them. And, and in particular, as a second uh, area uh, to delve into, I'd like to get an idea of what you think about with respect to how your discipline or your role that you currently play um, should be viewed with respect to environmental justice. What do you, I mean, clearly each one of you bring a lot to the body, but how do you see it? And um, I'm gonna start with um, Sanjay, uh, if I may. Great, thank you, Jamie. Yeah, how does, how does the discipline of climate adaptation engage in environmental justice work? And I think, you know, for folks on this call, most people are familiar with Boston. And if you've ever been to Chinatown, for instance, you can look at that neighborhood. We're doing our, a very detailed study of heat in Chinatown and how climate change intersects with just the way Chinatown has been built and shaped over decades. Um, and what we've learned through that process, we did some really detailed modeling and we learned that areas in Chinatown can be up to 10 degrees hotter than leafier areas of Boston. And what that means is not everyone is gonna experience climate change the same way. And this disproportionate impact that is gonna be experienced by people of color by low-income people often, if we don't act, um, is an extension and elaboration of all of the environmental justice work that has been going on for decades. And so when I think about how the discipline of climate adaptation really builds upon all the leadership that's happened over many decades in this space, it's really about how do we bring that history into the present the history of the decisions that have led to these disproportionate climate impacts that we are and will continue to experience if we don't act? And how do we try to do, solve both at the same time? The challenge of environmental justice during the climate crisis is really about understanding the history of how our cities are built, the history of decisions that were made, and how we can make sure that 
no one bears more than their fair share of the impacts of climate change because this is, this is our opportunity to address many of the historical living legacies of, of environmental racism that have been um, holding back many communities for generations. Yes, well, thank you, Sanjay. And, you know, just to comment on that very quickly, and that is that, you know, clearly the ex existential reality is that vulnerable communities such as Chinatown, uh, even in the most prosperous nations like the United States, will be the first and worst hit by the impacts of climate change. And in, in, in the context of the US, it's, as I say, communities of color, indigenous peoples, and low income communities that are socioeconomically disadvantaged and disproportionately burdened by poor environmental community and least able to adapt, where we're overlaying climate change on all of that. So it's a pretty devastating set of circumstances. But let me move then to ask um, Darren, if you would, as to how his particular discipline and expertise comes to bear on the environmental justice uh, set of issues. Yeah, th thank, thank you so much, uh, Jamie, for the question. And um, um, each, uh, each of you have all laid out some really important principles. Uh, I will say that as a I think I frame myself as a you know interdisciplinary scholar, uh, and um, to the extent that um, any scholar can kid themselves a scholar activist, uh, although activism work is really uh, a whole other thing. And and I'm so glad that uh, <laughs> there are there are actual activists on this panel. <laughs> so it's a really good uh, piece of that work. Um, I, I would say you know more as a scholar and advocate in producing knowledge that uh, I hope influences decision making and, and other scientists. Um, it, it it is you know walking this line at various times between you know uh, you know sell out and fighting for the good of my people. I mean quite honestly. Um, uh, I would say that I, I view my work very much in service to um, um, people and environment. Um, again, those are the values I was taught um, uh, as an indigenous youth and that um, my role in the university is actually to bring uh, resources. Uh, I, I honestly believe this to be my role to bring resources, both human and financial resources to to communities uh, most impacted by environmental injustice. Uh, and that, that frames up a lot of my work um, as well as really engaging and we have a number of programs for indigenous uh, youth here uh, in, in what is now Maine um, oriented towards uh, natural resource and environmental careers. And those are really um, that, uh, that put, put a strong value on indigenous knowledge and culture in the training of our indigenous scientists. Um, I, I would say also just in how we define and think about and engage uh, EJ is critical. And, um, you know, I think that this formulation of, you know, those who are most impacted having the most kinds of uh, authority or responses and, and, you know, that we mobilize, um, um, uh, Frameworks like FPIC, um, you know, free prior and informed consent on decision making around um, uh, decision making authority for communities, tribes, and neighborhoods. Uh, and, you know, I've been working on sort of thinking that through for a while. I, 2008, I published an article in the journal um, called Society and Natural Resources called the trust responsibility and limited sovereignty, what can environmental justice groups learn from Indian nations? Um, and really thinking about frameworks for um, increase in decision-making authority. Um, and I think as an anthropologist, um, this space that we as anthropologists sometimes can, as, or as critical social scientists sometimes can really um, offer profound insight and critiques of sort of, you know, uh, policies that are sometimes meant to help people and maybe not <laughs> also, um, but that um, sort of, you know, the reality on the ground versus sort of the, the design in the policy arena and really um, um, doing that ground truthing work and, and, and honestly looking at these impacts on, 
on peoples uh, and their environments and, and having that space to kind of go back and forth with a real recognition of, of the power uh, that we can bear as, as academics, but also um, uh, the, the ways in which we can and should sort of put communities in, uh, in our scholarship first. So to me, that's, you know, my various roles, I'm involved in so many different things that, you know, as a scholar, I'm, I'm privileged enough to engage in a lot of work that probably, uh, you know, uh, I'm not officially paid for, um, but are, is meaningful in that it's in service to an environment, people, and and in our overall um, sort of possible future as humans on this planet. So I, I really appreciate the question and uh, um, just that's just scratching the surface, I'm sure. So I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you very much, Darren. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's um, useful to mention at this point that um, before I turn over to Jasmine and she can think a little bit more about uh, how she's gonna engage the question. But anyway, before I jump <laughs> to Jasmine, let me just say that uh, scholar activists have been in the forefront of the environmental justice movement from the very beginning. It goes, you know, we can go back to someone like Bob Bullard, who, uh, Professor Bob Bullard, who wrote a book called Dumping in Dixie and, and really initially co coined the term environmental racism but he's gone way beyond that. And he's still an active participant in the movement. And, um, and as I say, my uh, teaching fellow, Nikki Sheets, who is out there, got a PhD at, at Harvard under Jim McCarthy and Mike McElroy, who some of you may know, uh, may, have, may have heard of, uh, leading uh, environmental um, scholars at, uh, at Harvard. But anyway, scholar activist, Darren is um, in the long tradition of talented, scholar activists who also make a commitment to working with the community and being supportive of the community. So thank you, Darren. Now, Jasmine, could you uh, tell us a little bit about how you think about this issue? Yes. Um, so one, one of the main ways that I think about this issue through all of the roles that I play um, are through the principles of environmental justice which were adopted at the People of Color um, Environmental Leadership Summit in 1991. Um, so through the NAACP, I specifically think about the second principle. So environmental justice demands that public policy be based on mutual respect and justice for all people, free from any form of discrimination or bias. And with the NAACP being a historical civil rights organization, we kind of serve as a watchdog for issues affecting people of color, um, including environmental justice issues, with uh, Black Millennials for Flint, as well as the Flint Registry, um, I think about principle number seven. So environmental justice demands to the right to participate as equal partners at every level of decision-making, including a needs assessment, planning, implementation, enforcement, and evaluation. Um, with the Flint Public Health Youth Academy, I think about principle number 16, um, environmental justice calls for the education of present and future generations, which emphasizes social and environmental issues based on our experience and appreciation of our diverse cultural perspectives. Because we're truly aiming to educate the next generation um, in our community and across America. Another lens um, that I think about this EJ work through is uh, actually through Kwanzaa, which is you know the celebration of community, family, and culture um, as a way to help you know African Americans reconnect to our our African roots. Um, I think about the third principle of Kwanzaa in my work with Black Millennials for Flint, and that's uh, collective work and responsibility or Ujima, because we we have to care about not only our communities but others as well. So we have you know, those of us working in Flint, but we also have DC, we also have Memphis, we also have Baltimore, um, because we can't just, you know, have our heads down and mind our own business. We know in here in Flint, like we, I mean, our community was crying for 18 months about, you know, being being poisoned by our government. And, and we weren't, we weren't heard, but it wasn't until everyone else got involved and really um, helped to amplify this message that, you know, we, we were able to, remove the lead from our water. Um, so just thinking about both the principles of environmental justice and Kwanzaa, um, kind of how I, how I do the work. Well, thank you. It's, um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that you, uh, and important that you brought in 
the various principles of environmental justice. And, you know, as we discussed, uh, they were promulgated in 1991 by really uh, representatives of local and regional uh, movements from across the country coming together in Washington, DC. And the point being that they still, as you so articulately uh, uh, demonstrated, have full applicability uh, to today's set of issues and, and problems. So uh, I appreciate that, Jasmine, and that's really terrific. There, um, another question that I'd love to have um, each of you engage on, and that is the question of whether environmental justice uh, or the effort to bring environmental justice must necessarily impact negatively on economic opportunity. Over the years, there have been so many people who have tried to pit economic opportunity and development and jobs on the one hand against environmental justice and somehow setting up that false, well, I would argue false choice, but I, you know, I wonder uh, how you uh, think about that. Uh, Sanjay, can I ask you if you have a perspective on it? Yeah, I think that's a good, a good question and definitely a false choice. You know, it's this, this moment we're in, you know, we have an opportunity to really have from scholar activists and from many others, clear data on the effects of the choices we've made on the siting of facilities, on how um, exposed people are in, in their jobs, in their everyday life to different risks. And there's, <laughs> there, there's no way you can say by, by uh, you know, polluting the air quality around a low income population. <laughs> We are, we are doing right by them. We are, you know, when you're thinking about the effects that chronic asthma has, the effects that uh, high levels of air pollution have on heart disease and the, the kind of precarious nature of accessing healthcare in the United States, um, you, can't, you can't say that these are opposed, they're actually together, right? By, by focusing on environmental justice, you are stabilizing, providing resilience to residents to have a solid foundation to deal with decades of instability, neighborhood instability, challenges of building gener generational wealth that have held people back, held entire communities back. And if you are constantly putting these <laughs> against each other, you're ultimately saying, you're ultimately making a choice. You're saying, here's the people that we're willing to protect and here's the people we aren't and surely we're better than that and i think that's the opportunity we have by connecting these two and linking them because they are linked and they're linked in the sense that the more that we develop an economy and deliver an economy that centers environmental justice we won't have folks making this false choice and feeling like they're stuck where they have to choose to cite in the example of chinatown again there's, there's a park, Reggie Wong Park, that's sited next to uh, <laughs> uh, an energy plant, a, a facility that burns uh, fuel oil. Next to a surface parking lot, next to an uncapped uh, highway system. Mm -hmm. And if you think <laughs> about that, you know, you have folks saying, well, we needed to have this highway here, we needed to have this facility here, we needed to have this parking here. And this is one of the few parks in Chinatown. And so there's a lot of opportunity to realign ourselves and make, make the right choice. Thank you, Sanjay. I'm going to um, go a little bit out of my traditional order here and uh, jump to Jasmine and, and ask her if she might comment on, uh, on that question and how she sees it, particularly with all her work at the local level. Yeah, so uh, similar to you all, I have the same kind of perspective, like, no, it doesn't have a negative impact on economic opportunity and it actually has a positive impact. Um, and it's important to know that it's extremely costly to ignore environmental justice issues. Um, you know, we see the cost daily um, of ignoring, for example, our infrastructure with our natural or unnatural disasters that we, you know, we're seeing. We see um, really costly health issues 
I know right now in Flint, we're, um, we're really pleading with the governor and our, our state uh, environmental and Great Lakes and Energy Department to not um, put an asphalt plant, right? And it's not in the city of Flint, but it's directly across the street, which we know will emit, you know, more lead, more PM 2.5, PM 10, you know, and, and if we do allow this to happen, for example, it's gonna cost so much more in healthcare down the line. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about it like that. And then when it comes to people just, I don't know, making a living, it, it opens doors for creativity. Um, whether you're doing research or you're, you know, doing stuff in the business world, like you can get, it, it's like the next phase of, of our ingenuity. Um, and then I think about President Biden's Justice 40 initiative. And, um, you know, that's setting a goal for disadvantaged communities, EJ communities, um, most impacted by climate change and pollution to really receive about 40% um, or at least 40% of uh, federal investments in climate and clean energy. So there's literal money in, in this work. Um, so, so absolutely, it, it has a positive impact and not a negative. Thanks, Jasmine. Darren, what's your take on, on the question? Yeah, and th and, th and th thank you uh, all for that, and um, great to see uh, Anna on here as well. So, um, yes, I'll I'll really just uh, I hate to be uh, this I, this a little bit more on the scholarly side. What I think is really interesting is, uh, and, and this you know uh, goes back to the to the nineties when we first met Jamie. The um, I think one of the real challenges was you know we were following the work of folks like. Mark Sagoff and, and others who are really mm -hmm. trying to include, you know, basically into economic <laughs> frameworks, the, the, the things that are considered external to, to the, the profit margin, you know, the, 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 the kind of mm -hmm. healthcare mm -hmm. impacts on, on communities that are, you know, basically externalized from the, the, the way our capitalist market system <laughs> works where, Profit is individualized, and then the burden and and the uh, impacts are 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 collectivized, but not of course broadly. They're collectivized onto very specific peoples in very specific places, and that's you know part of what environmental injustice is. And I think um, you know I had worked with an environmental economist on on some work as well in the in the early two thousands. Um, and I think, you know, trying to influence policymakers into sort of the brokenness of that system of, you know, basically trying to include these externalities into policy decisions. I think we made some progress and I think um, that all often still gets lost in what would otherwise be political debates, whether they exist on the right or the left. Um, what I would say, and, and I think this the new, the new uh, activists are, uh, you know, kind of ignoring that trap a little bit, you know, of like e e economy versus environment or mm -hmm. justice versus not. And I think really just saying, you know, any society has, you know, moral ethical obligations that justice is is not a, 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 a transferable quality mm -hmm. uh, across economic uh, domains and really standing on. And I see this um, has always been the strength right from the 91 uh, statement that it is this is not a a movement or or a notion that is like you know we're gonna just <laughs> uh, go away or it's uh, it's an economic trade off of some sense our dignity um, and our uh, our right to a, a healthy place to live and, and, and without uh, undo you know all these burdens that that is not a, an economic trade off either so I think you know to me that. That debate, you know, we've kind of gone back and forth a little bit. Maybe Jamie, you have a different take on it, but I think, you know, I think we've we've really come to uh, uh, well pushing on that in the environmental economic sphere. Really looking at sort of how those, you know, the costs are there. Of course, we know them. They just happen to be costs borne by people who are not, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, part of some, you know, the, the elites or the decision makers. And that's why, you know, even things like, you know, I teach about Standing Rock, which happened now five years ago. That's why Black Lives Matter was at Standing Rock. You know, I mean, that's mm -hmm. not a, that's not mm -hmm. a thing yep. or a coincidence, right? It's mm -hmm. the, the dignity and value of people that exist beyond economic trade-off that is about 
yeah, we are valuable. Uh, our places are valuable. Our, our our lives are valuable. And I think that's, um, I think we're on the edge of something really important. If we look back at Standing Rock and some of the movements um, um, before and, and since, I think that that overall move towards an ethical value of all lives and then, um, Sorry, I'm not mobilizing an all life thing, but but actually valuing um, um, people's <laughs> lives, in, in no matter where where and who they are, and 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 encountering this sort of economic logic, which which diminishes certain people. So I think that's my kind of uh, take on it. Hopefully that's well. It. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Darren. Appreciate that. I, I want to now in invite Anna to join us, and I'm going to. Um, come in with that question, but also I'd, I'd love to hear at the outset how she uh, first engaged with environmental justice, uh, how, how it became a part of uh, what she does and how she thinks about things. And we'll remember that she's a local government official, local elected government official, I believe, and uh, certainly a policymaker. So with that perspective, Anna, could you share your uh, engagement initially? Sure. Thank you very much, Jamie, and it's great to be here. So my name is Ana Sandoval. I, um, I was born in Mexico and grew up in the United States uh, here in San Antonio, Texas, and I like to say the home of the Alamo and the Spurs, but it also has a very long history of, of inequalities uh, and, you know, and same that have been mirrored across the, the U.S. And, and the South, but I, I actually started in the field uh, studying atmospheric modeling and I was working, so it was very separated from uh, the human impact. I, I worked on, I modeled in Fortran and I was stuck in a basement for, for years of my life in, in <laughs> graduate school. Uh, and then when I came home to work, uh, or when I went into the work field, I was working at an air pollution control agency and eventually found my way into the communications office and community relations which is of course not what I expected to do with my, my years of Fortran programming experience. Um, but what, what I found was that members of the community, and these are communities that had been redlined, that were of course um, highly made up of color. I'll, I'll give you one example, in particular in the San Francisco Bay area when I worked there, we had the community that lived in the Bayview Hunters Point area, which had a, a tremendous concentration of public housing at the time that was uh, sitting over naturally occurring asbestos. And it was very close to, it was um, that like in the rock, that there is such a thing as naturally occurring asbestos. Mm -hmm. And there were freeways right around it. And of course you can imagine uh, not far from the port of San Francisco and not far from the port of Oakland, there's certainly a lot of diesel pollution that gets carried, which is a carcinogen itself. So mm -hmm. this is an example of a community that I was working with who came to our organization and said, you know, you've got to do something about the air quality because I'm having X, Y, and Z um, medical or health impacts. And for all the work I had done, um, you know, about technology, about air pollution and reactions and, you know, what, whatever you call it, bag houses, all this control technology, I could not um, articulate any of the health impacts or really um, relate to, to what they were experiencing. So it started there for me and realizing, um, I went back to school after that and that's when I went to Harvard to, to get the, the master's in public health, realizing that beyond the, beyond the air pollution environment, there are all the other social factors that contribute to, to health. And when you talk about environmental justice communities, you will also see uh, um, all those other factors generally occurring, right? There are health inequities, there are uh, food access inequities, there are job and economic inequities and educational inequities as well. So this, this is one piece of, of that. Oh, thank you, Anna. And um, we're going to move in a moment, I think, to, um, taking questions from uh, the attendees. But um, let me ask one last question of the panel and um, you know, maybe sort of quick, uh, quick responses. And um, so if there were a, a project or an idea or a goal that you would want to uh, implement immediately, what would it be and what would be its downstream consequences? 
obviously a project that affects positively the environmental justice communities that you deal with. Is there, and, and I'm, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, since you haven't had a chance to join in too much and I'm gonna start right with you, Anna, sorry. Great, I have a hundred of these ideas. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and uh, so I, when I was uh, in the Bay Area, uh, there was some land use guidelines that are, you know, they're issued and uh, different agencies issue them. And they basically pro provide guidance around a new pollution source that might be coming in and how to mitigate that. So uh, we don't have anything like that in, in Texas or in San Antonio, well, at the federal level, but it's extremely light. Uh, here in, in San Antonio. And I've been to parts of the city where you'll see a playground next to uh, some kind of concrete plant or, um, and we still have a lot of industrial uses very close to uh, low, low property value housing. So if I could do anything, it would be to, um, to regulate uh, pollution according to the source, sorry, the, the recipients that are are next to it. So d d based on the use, the land use that's next to it. So for instance, if I wanna put in um, a, a car painting and body shop, um, I would not be able to do that next to a daycare center unless I had super high technology to, to contain all of those uh, emissions. And of course, protect the workers because they're the ones that are most often uh, exposed to the highest levels of, of contamination. So I would protect our schools, our, um, our senior facilities, our daycares, <laughs> and those types of what they call sensitive receptors. So, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jasmine, do you have a... Uh... A particular uh, project you'd like to push forward? Absolutely. Um, so I would love to see us build up like or expand the number of people who are interested in doing this work, um, build up the community of people interested in working in this space and seeing how people can make this connect to their work. I, I keep talking about the Flint Public Health Youth Academy because these like these mm -hmm. kids are mm -hmm. so awesome. And we're, mm -hmm. we're teaching them, you know, curriculum, policy, research, and giving them a platform to speak about public health issues. And I would love to see this Flint Public Health Youth Academy expand to other cities, um, have a national public health youth academy. And I know that's that's some of what uh, Dr. Key is is looking to do. But downstream, like we'll have fewer people who are anti-science, anti-public health, anti-climate change. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's perplexing that. Um, some of these issues are debatable, you know, or seem or seem debatable. It's like we have to do this, and now, so if we have more people on on the side of that, um, I think it'll it'll be great. And having more leaders prepared to just tackle the the pressing issues of our time. Um, so I would I would love to see a national public health youth academy. And feel free to contact me if if that's something you're interested in in your city. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's really great. Uh, let me um, actually, I'm going to ask uh, panelists to pick up on that a little bit if they, you know, if they have a, a viewpoint. And that is to say, think about how do we make a career out of this interest and involvement in environmental justice? Because after all, as Jasmine, I think is so clearly indicated, it's the young people that we want to be sure have the opportunity and the um, uh, involvement in, um, in dealing with these issues for their communities. So um, Sanjay, do you have a, a view on that? Yeah, I'll try to get both of those quickly. Um, you know, I think, you know, in Climate Ready Boston, we have like more than a hundred strategies that we're trying to implement. So it's kind of like <laughs> sure. hard to pick your favorite kid. But I think one of the ones that is really worth highlighting is just really focusing on the standards for buildings across our country, right? Whether it's senior care, like whether it's schools, whether it's um, hospitals, the disproportionate impacts are felt in those moments. And we have such an opportunity to really set clearer standards that not only prepare us for the climate crisis, but also address these disparities that folks are experiencing. And we know from research that hotter schools mean 
um, folks' learning outcomes are affected. And when we standardize test all the kids, um, we're not adjusting it based off of their environmental exposures. So what are we really saying? You know, is this fair? Are we really judging who is ready to contribute at the highest level? Or are we judging, you know, who had mm -hmm. the friendliest environment to live in and grow up mm -hmm. in? And yeah. I think, you know, I, I grew up in Bismarck, North Dakota. I remember when my middle school, um, only half of it was air conditioned. I really didn't want to go to uh, uh, ninth grade because that wing wasn't air conditioned. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember the experience of that. And it sounds, you know, whatever it is, um, it was, you know, how does how did that affect all these folks I, I grew up with and mm -hmm. how they experienced uh, that grade, that critical grade. And that's happening to people over and over again. So I would just say, that's a clear win. There's a lot of work happening at the federal, state, and city levels to try to live to deliver on that. And in terms of building careers, seek mentors. You know, I'm always happy to chat with folks who are 100% dedicated to building their career in this space and just want some guidance. Um, but also build peer mentors. You know, there's a whole community of folks who are just like you if you're thinking about getting into this career, and go talk to them, and you know, just show up, show up at each event go talk to them, build your network, and you'd be surprised how quickly stuff can happen. Um, there's been a lot of decades of leadership in the space and now folks are really primed and ready to jump in. And so don't be shy, <laughs> just get out there. Thank you, Sanjay, that you really uh, make an excellent point. Darren, you're in the educational institution and training young minds and all the rest of it. So how, what, how do you think about uh, the, 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 the challenge of careers in this field? Yeah, no, uh, thank, thanks for the question. I, and I, um, you know, I mentioned briefly the, the Wabanaki Youth in Science program, you know, um, one, of the, one of the fundamental um, pieces of that is, you know, um, our students recognizing um, the value of, of their roles and responsibility to uh, our environment. That's, you know, directly from our, from our teachings, but also, you know, uh, um, uh, native native students have uh, not increased their participation in science fields in the last uh, 20 plus years uh, in the same way that um, other racialized minorities have. So what we're seeing in terms of this curriculum where we do value and, and give a really direct voice to indigenous uh, science and, and, and culture as a part of the scientific training, you know, is is a key um, element of recruitment retention and pathway success for native students in in the sciences and so for us you know that's our you know <laughs> uh, we have fairly focused on on native students there but we're seeing that um, in our uh, research on this as well that it, um, all students uh, benefit from from these uh, kinds of uh, different knowledge systems in their science education, and and um, um, students, you know, who are uh, normally um, uh, uh, you know, don't have this higher percentages of uh, maintaining their majors in science fields, you know, which are the you know, BIPOC and, and, and poor, poor students, first generation students, they also hugely benefit from the inclusion of indigenous science and, 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 um, and knowledge in science classes. So I think, you know, for us that that next generation, and we see this with the climate justice movement, um, indigenous people are at the fore. Uh, it's very much an intersectional space that, that recognizes, you um, Indigenous uh, peoples and and, uh, and BIPOC and all all uh, uh, groups that are you know basically going to be the most impacted by uh, this coming climate uh, uh, change um, already happening climate climate change and sort of how we adapt. So you know for me that that you know it requires some transformations within our educational system to to what we value what you know what we actually um uh teach in the classroom and sort of how we frame our relationship to our knowledge which is um really really critical as we as we move forward i think our you know the younger 
I'm, I'm definitely, you know, a Gen Xer, Jamie, and uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not one of these people who's like, oh, millennials and Gen Z, they're so horrible. I think they're, they're <laughs> awesome, and I want to see more of them in decision making um, um, spaces because they are unburdened and want these new approaches. And I, I, I just, you know, so that's my little thing, as well as. Uh, you know, for me, the, the the just to tag on the other part of the question, just like what are the projects? And of course, I have so many projects. If anyone wants to help support our Ways program, please <laughs> uh, reach out to me. Um, but uh, the you know, I really do think you know, as I've been digging into the work around climate adaptation and just the you know, returning to one of the pieces I mentioned before, just community communities having more control over this um, and being very. Uh, uh, um, at the forefront of decision making about how we adapt and not it, it 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 just strikes me that the resources and I'm I'm glad I'm you know I think there are movements that I support very much in the Biden administration you know it's always like is it going is it enough is it going too slow and and probably yeah not enough is probably going too slow but uh you know in terms of just you know transforming um the resources that communities can access around adaptation projects, um, you know, it's almost impossible. Um, you know, there's so many um, burdens and you have to already be in a disaster area. You have to already be basically without, you know, basic resources to then suddenly try to think about how you're going to adapt to climate in the next decade um, with with you know real risk uh, pieces. So this, this is just getting back to Sanjay's you know piece about buildings and and how that functions in the context of communities. I think is really really critical. And and I would just say um, more the the more resources we can invest in sort of you know, climate adaptation in the communities that are going to be most impacted and the people that are most being. And that's a fundamental about what a climate justice uh, response is about, because clearly we are, we are as the you know, most recent scientific reports, we're, we're, we're looking at a warming climate at least until 2050. So it's not, it's not getting you know, particularly better. It's, it's, we have to be very focused on uh, these impacts and empowering people to adapt uh, in the ways that they see fit. So um, I'll, I'll end my, my answer there, but thank you for the question. Well, yeah, th thank you, Darren. Uh, one of the attendees asked the question is a little bit different, I think, but um, uh, let me throw it out there. Uh, and that is whether the problem of low vaccine rates that we're as a country struggling with in particular communities, whether that has any relation to the problem of environmental injustice in, in many communities. I wonder if anyone on the panel has a, has a view on that. Uh, maybe, um, maybe uh, Anna, can I ask you if you have a view? Sure. So here in, um, I can talk a little bit about San Antonio. Uh, we've worked very hard to try to uh, get our community vaccinated. And by far, the zip codes in our area with the lowest vaccination rates of the eligible population, the lowest vaccination rates are also the ones that have faced some of the worst environmental and economic injustices in, in our community. Um, they're also, like I said, they overlap and, and also I are the same areas where we see uh, the lowest levels of uh, educational achievement, economic achievement, and, um, and even in our case, domestic violence rates are the highest in those areas. So um, they absolutely overlap. Uh, and I, I would uh, link it to issues like a distrust of government, number one, because um, there has, because these areas have been neglected for, for mm -hmm. so long, despite what we're trying to do now, that's just a generational, mm -hmm. uh, generationally inherent uh, frame mm -hmm. of mind for, mm -hmm. for residents that have been there for, for that long. And, and another thing I would link it to is that we as, uh, as these um, status quo institutions perhaps do not know how best to communicate with the hard to reach populations and it's showing up mm -hmm. uh, this way. So we have a great job. Uh, we've done a great job vaccinating folks who have access to the internet 
uh, have a car, have, you know, all these other things available to them. But for folks who don't have that or are immigrant populations, we simply don't have not developed enough sophisticated tools to reach them and to build trust with them yet. Excellent point. Uh, Jasmine, with your uh, background in public health and expertise, I wonder if you have a perspective on that question. Um, so my perspective is almost exactly the same as Anna's. Um, mm -hmm. in, my, in my county, in Genesee County, we are around 55% um, of people having had their first and second dose of the vaccine. And it's lowest in, of course, black and brown um, populations. And I mean, that government mistrust is at the top of the list. Um, people, people do not trust the government after after the Flint water crisis and, you know, it's still ongoing, but people don't, people don't trust it. And then you have, you know, the layers of historical mistrust from Tuskegee to, you know, all, all types mm -hmm. of things. Sure. Um, she, she spoke about the communication um, barriers that exist both um, in our community in terms of language and in terms of literacy levels. Um, and we saw during the water crisis, you know, people who spoke Spanish and Arabic were the last to, to receive um, notification that, that that our water was tainted um, and and similar things kind of happened in COVID although there were some some things that improved um, because we've had that uh, you know the the network of partnerships um, and then I, I think another one that has just come up uh, is around like the immune boosting like pe people want to bo boost their immune system in natural ways and um, you, you've seen kind of a an either or rather than a both and type of approach to that. Like we we should totally be eating, you know, our oranges and, you know, getting our fruits and vegetables, but we need to get this vaccine as well. Um, but I mean, it goes hand in hand with, with the environmental justice stuff. Oh, thank you, uh, Jasmine. Uh, and let them, um, there have been, you know, a variety of different questions that have been coming from the uh, uh, audience. Um, in one that, um, again, is a little bit different, but uh, is from a, an attendee who is from Louisiana, deeply uh, engaged with climate change problems, notes that the pop black population is 32%. There's six HBCUs in the area. The question is what can Harvard do and should Harvard do to help these communities? Anyone, and I'm gonna just ask if anyone wants to engage that. Uh, you know, and remember the Harvard Alumni Association is listening. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, you know, what, <laughs> what, what, uh, anyone have any views on that that wants to talk about that? I mean, one of the things that uh, I, I might just say that um, has been very, very uh, impressive uh, over the years, I think, is the degree to which the HBCUs have um, engaged on the environmental justice uh, issue and problem. Uh, scholars, uh, scholar activists and, uh, uh, Darren undoubtedly knows about like Bob Bullard uh, and Beverly Wright and, and others have been uh, really for 35, 40 years have been uh, doing battle on that. And they are um, scholars at HBCUs uh, in uh, Louisiana and Texas and, and so forth. Uh, so we would like to think, and certainly there are many initiatives from Harvard, but we'd like to think that they, such initiatives can be focused and really, you know, help some of these communities that are uh, in trouble. Yeah, Darren, Jamie, do you have a thought? Yeah, yeah, yeah Jamie, I just I was just thinking like, um, I mean, I've had these discussions, obviously. <laughs> as an academic, I'm not at Harvard, so I don't have that, that, that kind of resources. But, um, you know, the, the model that we've talked about uh, that um, with with just an, enough of the right twists is, is the the long term ecological research research networks that LTERs um, have had um, the Baltimore one in particular has had some really nice uh, EJ oriented research um, that is really supported and supportive of, of community endeavors there. Um, I think they can do more, but I think, you know, that's the kind of investment that, um, you know, there these are NSF funded and historically, but uh, with, with, you know, major uh, outlays by institutions and support where, 
Um, you know, I think one of the things that they solve, which academics are very bad at, is the kind of hit and run research relationships, that they make an investment mm -hmm. in uh, communities, in a place mm -hmm. that, um, and the people, you know, quite honestly, in, in developing partnerships and, and um, that kind of work. So I think, you know, in a, a very EJ conscious type of LTER with uh, in the context of of a of a place like Louisiana with HBCUs, it's never just a single institution, right? It mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. you know, making use of the 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 very the, the strengths of different kinds of institutions of different kinds of of of, of researchers and and really having at its core, which hasn't been historically the case, but at its core, you know, a a, a an EJ mission, you know, like mm -hmm. in terms of mobilizing community well-being and research for those ends and having a very strong, some of these have had very strong community sort of um, advisory boards and maybe you could even have them as more directive. So I think I think that's the kind of thing that, you know, Harvard could uh, create and, 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 you know, make a call to other institutions with the HBCUs down there to, to make a real investment and and not, you know, again, it's it's not the extractive research, but it's a, a real commitment to the community's well-being uh, through relationships um, and 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 in research that is focused on mobilizing um, community needs and and priorities for sure. Thank you. This is very helpful, uh, Darren. Uh, Chris is letting me know that we're, uh, you know, reaching the witching hour, so to speak. But uh, uh, I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, I don't know if any, if any of you want to make one last, you know, comment, brief comment. Uh, please feel free. But I'm not going to ask any more questions at the moment because we are at that point. Uh, there's been a I think a really enriching discussion and we've moved on uh, around a lot of places. Um, you know, we didn't get in depth, in, but that last question it seems to me is, is, is very interesting because it's important, it seems to me that institutions like Harvard, not just Harvard, but certainly Harvard with its resources and otherwise, uh, partner with communities to um, address these problems. There's a responsibility, uh, number one, both because it's just a responsibility in broad terms, but also, again, because of resources and, and, and otherwise. So, you know, um, I'm glad that that was posed by uh, someone in our audience. Any last comments by our uh, panelists? Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thanks to HAA. It's a, um, you know, really a, um, a pleasure to know that our alumni association is engaging on topics like this. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to have, um, to have participated. Yeah, uh, Yvonne, is that? Uh... Thank you, Jamie. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really was so moved by this conversation and I wanna thank all of our speakers, Jamie, Sanjay, Jasmine and Anna and Darren for this and incredibly Biggie. engaging and inspiring <laughs> discussion. And I also wanna extend an additional thanks to our audience for their participation today. Please uh, don't forget to join us for our next Unity panel, Dare to Dream, Tangible Skills for Entrepreneurship. That panel is going to begin at 1.45 Eastern Standard Time. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.